data on you using flats and it feeling better when you're at more maximal weights. Um, you know, that's something to consider. The only reason like why I'm a little bit concerned about that is because sometimes like there can be some issues with your overall recovery and stressing like different joint structures where we haven't really been, been stressing them for that long. Um, I think that like what you said though with, right guys, so I'm just doing um, my, my check-ins, you guys saw like, just a little bit of a clip. So basically what I do with my check-ins is I have my, my client programs and then um, like my fluff, like right here. And so like, you know, you can see like everything with like all the data. Um, so my client Oscar, like tracking things, um, whatever. But basically what I do is I will, my client send me over a video check-in. Um, and then I, you know, five to 10 minutes long, I respond back to my own feedback within five to 10 minutes going over everything that, that, that they said, kind of like an ongoing conversation. And then what we do is, um, you know, we'll go back and forth in WhatsApp. I have a group chat for my, for my, my clients to go over their form there. So it's like super comprehensive. Um, something that a lot of coaches don't do is something that I do and I've found just better results with it. Um, and I basically just send them over what I uh, what I give them. So I'm just working through um, check-ins right, right now. I woke up and did some some cardio. I've just been doing work today. Uh, you know, it's Easter every, every single day. Um, I have like, like, business is, is booming right now. I'm really happy with everything. Uh, clients are crushing it. Um, and I'm actually going to be hiring an assistant, an assistant coach, Philip, because um, I am swamped. I have been like so many inquiries. It's like I am at capacity right now. Um, so it's been exciting seeing um, you know everybody crush their crush their goals. Um, but yeah, I'm going, going to run through check-ins, and then I got a new guitar rig. I want to show you guys. Okay, so I'm just taking, taking a little break from from check-ins, but I got a few to come in from my other clients. But I'm going to show you guys what I got with my guitar rig. So just like a background story, I have not spent money on myself in literally six years. All I have spent my money on is basic living expenses, college, and my business. Um, and so this is like a really big splurge for me that I haven't, I was really happy I was able to do. Um, everything here costs about $5,500, so it was a pretty big, big, big splurge. Um, because I've just been, you know, haven't spent money in six years. Like it was, I'm totally fine to do it. But I um, wanted to show you guys a little bit of what I got and a little bit more of like, you know, the specs of it. So this is going to be um, my amplifier. This is a Fender um, Hot Rod Deluxe 40 Watt tube amp. Um, tube amps are, the, or they're basically, there are two types of amps. There are solid state amps and there's tube amps. Solid state amps do not have tubes. They had to be a little bit drier, less responsive, less warm sounding with their tone. Whereas tube amps are like what professional music, musicians mu use. They sound warmer, they're more responsive, um, and just have better overall tone. Um, and this is basically a um, really, really good amp for um, live gigs. We're, go we're going with, um, performances um, and also like just like if this is a tweed fender amp and tweed amps are basically legendary for their tones so really happy with that i'm really excited about that um, then this is going to be um, my pedal board so um, first off is that this is going to be this rack unit you know, right here is a temple audio pedal board um, basically um, pedal boards just help organize your pedals, keep them more, you know, less chords. There's a lot of chords involved with electric guitars. So I'm not guessing it's only standalone only instrument. There's a lot of cables, there's a lot of um, electronics, etc. So that is the pedal board that I have just to make everything like all in one spot. It's easier to carry around. Um, if I go and play with some friends or have a gig, um, then I also have a pedal power unit, which basically is right under, under underneath here. Basically, I have the wires running up into my pedals um, to basically. Um, power them. So for example, if I turn on um, this power block You can see that you know, we're gonna have the lights um, Flash on on the whammy and if I press this on and off It turns on turns off um, This is a, a Digitech, Digitech whammy pedal. It has pitch shifting um, So if you think about Tom Tom Rello raging against them the, the machine muse um, this FOD drive is a um, Green Day sounding pedal um, so it's basically, or like Food Fighters, super really nice um, classic overdrive sound. It's basically like a Marshall Plexi cab and like one other um, amp model. This is going to be a multi-effects pedal called the Helix Stomp. Basically, um, multi-effects pedals just allow for, um, you have several like pedals in one little small packed unit. Um, they're basically model famous pedals and original pedals. And they also, also have some really awesome um, amp modeling. So like an AC30 or a Plexi. Etc. Um, so that's my pedal board. Um, basically, all the cool sounds come out come, come out of that in conjunction with, with the amp. And then I got a couple of electric guitars. So I got an Epiphone 1959 Limited Edition Les Paul. Um, 
and uh, this Sunburst, I'm really happy with it. Plays beautifully. Got the humbucker pickups. Um, basically, these are Gibson burst buckers, and um, has, basically this Epiphone Les Paul is essentially a Les Paul without the headstock saying Gibson on it. Um, basically, like Gibsons are extremely expensive. If I was to get an actual Gibson, it would have cost me like thirty-five hundred dollars, and like I just don't need that. Um, you know, maybe eventually down down the road, I will get a lot less Les Paul. Will probably be custom shot. Was running more around like fifty-five hundred dollars. Um, but this Epiphone Les Paul is great. It sounds perfect. Um, like all the reviews online, people are like, it sounds just as good, if not as better than just, you know, lots of Gibsons. Um, Gibsons are very inconsistent, um, but that's part of their, you know, what makes them good. Uh, too, like you can get a really nice one or a really bad one. Like they feel different, etc. Um, but yeah, this is a really nice guitar I got. Then this is going to be, um, my Fender American Pro Stratocaster. Um, I am in love with this color. Um, this is going, this is just the perfect color. I love the, the maple neck. Um, beautiful. Uh, sounds great. Um, so that is my electric. And then I also have down here, I have an acoustic. That's what I've, I've had for a few years though. Um, this is my Taylor acoustic guitar. I got this. I was working at Guitar Center, and uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful in, in, it's instrument. Um, it sounds beautiful. That's a humidifier right in there. If you have an acoustic guitar, you want to have a, a humidifier, just because you know you'll have like some warping of, of the wood, and uh, it helps it just last longer. Um, these cost like twenty bucks. It's something that you should have if you um, if you have an acoustic. So. Yeah, I'll show you guys what it sounds like. Day. Um, I didn't end up recording the rest of it because I was kind of busy with work. Um, also, just had like a pretty boring back workout. Um, basically, what I'm doing right now is I have to do train seven days a week. Um, but like, basically, my Sunday workout was rather easy, full volume. I don't really feel that fatigued from it. Um, but right now, I'm just at the gym doing cardio, also answering clients and some some check-ins and doing some um, Instagram posts. I do cardio like every day for about um, about an, an hour, and I think it's something that's really been um, overall neglected with most people, especially strength athletes, because they're like, oh, you know, it's going to make me lose my gains or whatever. And the reality is that you know, if you're doing something like walking, like low intensity, like I'm doing right now, 
um, you're going to go just zone two cardio. I'm getting my heart rate between 120 and 140 beats per minute. Um, it's really good for health, number one. Number two, you stop going to interfere with recovery as long as you're eating enough. Um, you can basically do like unlimited amounts of walking as long as your body is adapted to it over a period of time um, and recover just as fine and still build muscle, lose fat, etc. as long as you're properly fueling your body for it. Um, but I mostly put in cardio for all my clients as like a base. So like say, so we're at like two times a week of like low intensity steady state cardio, getting a heart rate between 140, 100, 120, 140 beats per minute. And then you know, twice a week, getting, getting bare minimum 8,000 steps per day. And that's something that's really helpful for, allows you to eat a little bit more um, and stay leaner. It allows you to have a little better nutrition conditioning. Your overall health is going to be, going to be better. And one of the things that actually holds a lot of strength athletes back is their cardiovascular abilities because your cardiovascular system is actually used primarily during recovery on the in between sets, in between sessions. So something that you really do not want to neglect. So if you have not done cardio, I recommend number one, get a steps tracker. If you have a, a, a smartphone, like most phones have that on there as a like health app. Like I try to get my iPhone. Um, they do two times a week of zone two cardio. Get your heart rate 120, 140 beats per minute. Basically, you should be sweating. Um, we should be able to hold a conversation like I am right now. Um, do that twice per, per week. Um, so yeah, but besides that, last update is going to be um, bulk is going pretty well. Um, I'm using macro factor to um, do my, my bulk. Basically, the reason why is because I have a really hard time being objective with myself around the, the, the scale and knowing what, what signal versus noise because weight fluctuates. Um, and uh, macro factor kind of out everything for me, and it just puts me in a spot where, like I actually think that because the algorithms are so nuanced, you can actually gain like set your rate of weight gain for like one pound per month. Be pretty freaking close with it. Um, so that's what I'm doing on the 191.8 right now on average. Um, feeling good. Appetite's already kind of down. Um, bulking's always been kind of hard for me, especially because of the volume of food I have to eat. But I'm um, definitely feeling a little bit better with my overall recovery. But you know, definitely just need to focus a little more on sleep going forward. That's just been the number one thing. Um, like I need eight hours to really feel good. I really get that supposed to be around seven. Um, so that's what I'm really, really trying to do for this. I'll show you guys on um, my squat session today. Okay, so this is going to be um, my first peaking session of basically my prep. So I am five weeks out for my next meet. So I had a single RPE six that I had to work up to on a squat with a light, with a light back down four by four. Um, and it had a range of between 463 to 490 pounds for that. So I took 474 as my last warm up and it actually moved better. It moved like our RPE five. So I upped it to 490 and uh, felt about RPE six. So pretty high starting point on squats. My goal is to be able to, be able to move up to like a 523 at RPE eight, which is going to match what I did at my last meet. But basically, you know, obviously be submaximal. Obviously, what happens? Um, squats haven't been feeling great, um, and partially that's just because I have gotten into the habit of squatting high. So I'm not, ex or I guess not high, more so borderline depth. And um, you know, that's not what I want to be training at. You know, as a powerlifter, you want to be seeking depth and really leaving no doubt. So I'm not as strong. In that position is I have neglected really hitting that position position for the majority of my training since my last meet. And, you know, I have four weeks of progressive training to get stronger. And so roll in that position, in that end range position. So I'm really going to be disciplining myself to, you know, make sure I am seeking depth on um, really thinking about pushing my knees forward and bracing and slowing things down a little bit too, um, to help out with that. Then I did some, Light large and presses. Um, this is my fourth bench day, so this is really a sub five RPE bench day, um, just because I have my primary bench day after this. And I found that actually I feel a little, a little bit stronger after I do some really really light work on my right primary bench day. Um, don't really know why. Just sort of something I noticed that I did three sets of ten to fifteen on um, belt squat. This is a really 
really great exercise for me because my back gets really beat up from squats because I have very long femurs and then very short torso. And that's just not very good for overall squats. And frankly, you know, quads are my limiting factor in the squat. I have a much stronger back. So this really allows me to train my quads without the axial load of a squat being compressed on my back, which I seem to be actually very sensitive to in terms of the fatigue and being able to actually have some sort of spinal traction effect to sort of decompress my spine after squats. So I really, really like doing belt squats, pushing those once a week. Then I had um, three sets of 10 to 15 on incline bench dumbbell rows. I really like these because I just get a really great my muscle connection with, with them, always kind of have. So um, I push these a lot. Um, so something I wanted to talk, talk about really fast here is the difference between maximum adaptive volume for strength versus muscle growth. And the reality is that if you're trying to really train for strength, the maximum adaptive volume is, you know, pretty much significantly lower than it's for hypertrophy. Because I have noticed, for example, I grow more when I am more in that 15 to 20 sets per week, but I always see better strength gains if I'm within, you know, eight to, fi to 15 sets per week. And so this isn't to say, you know, hey, it's a bad thing to push volume every now and then. It's just to say that, hey, if you're really focused on building strength as much as you possibly can, well, probably are not going to be most optimally building muscle. Um, and it might be, you know, smart for you to, you know, maybe periodize that the period of time where you are maybe doing a little bit more volume is you might have a little bit better progress if you're more and more muscular when you come back to strength. So right now, because I'm peaking, my volume is a little bit lower. So I can sort of have a little bit of a peaking effect, obviously going into my meat, where I'm a little bit stronger than usual. So I'm going to be pulling back a little bit on my bench volume because I have definitely been pushing a little bit hard and hopefully see a pretty big increase leading into my meat. Okay, so I have had a fun car issue with my car's splash car and the bottom side of my Honda Fit got knocked loose, which is amazing because it's not like I don't have things to do, but I'm gonna deal with that right now. Um, so I'm gonna try to fix that um, the best that I can. All right guys, so hope you guys like the workout voiceover. Um, so I'm just going to go over just a few tips I have about how I stay lean year round and how you can also use these principles to stay year round. So number one thing that I do is I am very meticulous about my energy expenditure and my energy input. What does that mean? Basically, there are a couple ways we have to approximate energy expenditure, um, or the main way is going to be through step counts and you know how often that you do you do train. So, you know, keeping a consistent amount of set of volume that you're doing um, every single week, um, making sure that you are being consistent with um, you know how many steps that you're getting per per, per day, and then tracking your body weight changes. So, if you're maintaining your weight and you're keeping you know saying again ten thousand steps per, per day, you train five days a week for an average of like say twenty sets per session. Um, you're going, you know, okay, if I eat 3,000 calories, that's my main maintenance. Okay, well, now, now you know that. Um, and also, the other part I just addressed is knowing your intake, so tracking your food. So being aware of how much you're taking in, like using a food scale, um, having consistent food choices, learning how to, 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 to track. Um, second thing I do is with my food choices, I choose very minimally processed foods that are, you know, like lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, whole grains, etc. Like, honestly, it's like, you know, like I keep mostly like the 90-10 principle instead of like 80 20 and this helps manage my hunger a little bit better um so that's something that i also do um and then another thing is that i just like it's a skill to get this lean and to stay this lean so um you know one of my biggest recommendations recommendations is that if you're trying to get leaner just like do it slowly over time because you're not going to deal with that crazy re re on hunger that comes with you getting super super um lean or losing a large amount of weight in one go so you know maybe you're losing like one pound per week at the very most and you're limiting your weight loss to like 10 percent um of your body weight per weight loss phase and you're taking like diet breaks and you're taking this slow and then you really learn you know how like some good skills and fundamental habits such as 
you know, knowing how to track your steps, having a consistent step count. Um, you know, I, I like like the one, two, three roll where it's going to be like one big ass salad every single day, two pieces of fruit and like three meals per day or like three glasses of, of, of water. Like I like each meal or something like that. That's a really good way, way, way to do things. And then having like consistent, consistent habits. Um, and also knowing like what foods that you can eat that make you feel full, um, that you still enjoy. Um, and you know, not feeling like you have to like forego certain foods that you might like because like I still eat foods that I like just like in moderation. And that's another key is that learning how to be a moderator with your food intake is like is really important. So like you know I have the skill where I can have one cookie or I can have like a donut. I don't need to like have a, like you know, multiple of them. And so developing that skill takes some some time too. Um, and ultimately, it does come down to your genetics. So these all these things can help, but some people are just not going to feel good at like 10% body fat or, or less. Um, some people, the least they think they can be is 12% body fat. I mean, that's 15% body fat. That's totally fine. It's mostly based off of your genetics. And you will say have to go up like how you feel um, more than how you look too. Because like even if you are lean, like you feel like complete garbage, like you have no energy, etc. It's probably not worth it. But um, if you do want to want to get leaner, I do think that you can. I think everybody can get very, very lean. Just as sustaining it versus getting lean is a completely different thing. Um, I think the most success comes down to habits, restructuring your lifestyle, and asking myself, am I okay with these trade-offs? You know, like maybe you can stay a little bit leaner, but you're gonna be a little bit hungrier year-round, or you can't be as flexible with your, with your food intake. Most of your hunger is insane. Stuff like that. So just things to, con to consider. But um, again, just to re re reiterate, track your steps, track your food, eat mostly minimally processed foods, um, you know, probably 10% of your intake or less being from junk food that you like just to, you know, keep you on track. Um, you know, don't have like binge days, just like track your, your intake, be consistent with that. Have a consistent energy expenditure, track your steps. Um, adding in some cardio can help like, so like a practical recommendation is getting like 10 to 12,000 steps per day is a really, really good place to start. Um, it'll actually help monitor, manage your hunger a little bit better. You can eat a little bit more, uh, certain body weight and then just understand too, like, you, it gets easier to stay lean, in my opinion, the longer that you do stay leaner, like and easier to get leaner, the more often you kind of go throughout the process. So it, it's a skill. Um, if you guys are, you know, looking for help with that, you know, I do help people, you know, do that. So if you guys want to do that and um, apply for, for, for coaching um, down below. But if you guys like, like, like the video, I'm gonna close things off here. Um, but yeah, talk to you guys soon.